Hi, welcome back to Brooks's Base Corner. Today I have an interview for you with Level 42's main man, the bass thumb slinger, Mr. Mark King. This interview dates back to June 2015 and was recorded at Mark's place in London uh, during a period when Level 42 were busy doing festival shows and gearing up for some autumn shows. If you're enjoying the reviews, videos and interviews on the channel, please hit the subscribe button below. Hit the notification bell so that you receive notifications when I post up new videos. And please give this video a thumbs up, I would really appreciate it. If you have any questions regarding the video, leave them below and I'll come back to you as soon as I can. So as I said, this interview took place in June 2015 and was recorded at Mark's place here in London during a period when Level 42 were busy doing festival shows through the summer. So the interview was conducted for Bass Guitar Magazine here in the UK and features myself, my editor, Joel McIver, and our photographer, Tina Corhonan. And we set Mark a whole bunch of questions for about two hours. And as you'll hear, he's in fine form. He's got plenty to talk about. Take it away, Mark. So we started out by asking Mark, what are Level 42 up to in 2015? And does the band have a regular routine for working now? Just to well, we are on our non-touring year, but it's a good, it's a very busy festival year. We're, we're off this weekend. We've got two shows in Holland, two festivals. Um, we're back. We've got, I've got a thing I'm doing on my own uh, for uh, Norwegian TV the following weekend. And the weekend after that, I think, is that then when Camp Festival kicks in? We're doing Camp Festival yeah. and Car Fest North. Then we're doing uh, the Way Fest. We're doing the Crop Ready Festival. Oh, cool. We're playing, we, we've already done Cook and Rock the Mall and uh, Trondheim Jazz Festival. Then we've got uh, Bestival on the Isle of Wight and then uh, Car Fest South. Or something like that. Anyway, it's a, just a load of festivals on, which is okay. great. And then it sort of culminates really in late September. Um, we've got two shows at Indigo 2, uh, just as ourselves. And one more festival, and I can't remember where that is off the top of my head. And then that's sort of us done for, for this year. Yeah. Um, and next year, we've, we've already, I've just sort of signed off with Live Nation, the, the 19 dates in the UK, finishing at the even time. Oh, great. Apollo in London. So that'll be our show. We always tour a sort of October time. Yeah. I do that because my birthday's in October and everybody on the band and crew have to buy me a birthday present. <laughs> it so gets on their tits. I'm really supposed to write Mike because Mike's birthday's in March. And, <laughs> and he gets nothing. He gets nothing. He just gets a text. <laughs> Bless him. It, well, it works. The, the way that it seemed to sort of become apparent to me is that the to sort of keep your, your powder dry and to keep your stock high with, yeah. with, the, with your audience is if you go out every year, they get with it and then they don't come because they think well I'll see them again next year anyway you know I know they'll be out again but if you leave for 24 months you leave for two years it's, yeah. a, it's enough for them to sort of whet their appetite and you you can go out again and it's also it keeps it fresh for yourself and the guys in the band too because it, it it's not it, you know I, I have no problem playing the hits anyway yeah. and people sort of expect to see that when they come and see it you try and mix it up with putting the old, you know, maybe a new thing we did, we, we had this, um, an EP called Sirens out a couple of years ago, <coughs> which I really enjoyed making. It was sort of dance music, it was sort of going back to, to when we came in, which is very much just yeah. sort of extended 12 inch mixes, yeah. you know. And I got John Morales, a, a mixer from New York, involved in that, and, and it, was, it, it, it was good, and it proved to be, uh, it, it, was, it proved to sort of take the band on. To another, another step really, which is we, we sort of had a full brass section. So we tour with there's seven of us touring at the moment in the band, and it's very exciting to you know to hear the, the brass section kick in, uh, you know, and it adds another it adds a real a whole new you dimension, outfit. you know. And it was. It oh, did you? Yeah, I, I met you. Afterwards. Of course, yeah, yeah, you did. And yeah. Um, it just it was kind of rejuvenated the band. I think it worked well doing it for a while, and then yeah. you take it away and. Like when you did the jazz cafe and you brought Sean in, yeah, when yeah, you've done it right. for a couple of years and you had yeah. it, and it was just like the brass thing adds so much to the band. Yeah, it does, you know, and it's and it's it, it, it gives it a certain sound, obviously because it's brass. But you can get sort of you can get very dynamic 
Yeah. It adds a good sort of dynamic to it, you know. So will you personally recruit people like that, brass players, or do you have an MD, or are you the no, MD? No, I, I, I suppose I am the MD, yeah. you, know, I, yeah. you know, along with everybody else in the band who, you know, the, the sort of the pleasure of working with good musicians is that you, you don't, you know, it's like a drum machine, you only have to punch the information in once, you know, and then they, they know it. So it's not like a real drum where you have to Several keep punching. Times, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, you know, that, that you just say, look, I think, you know, I'd like to try this, you what you do what you want to do. Ah, so you don't arrange that part? And stuff. No, right. no, I don't. The, uh, you know, I, uh, this is how the song goes, and it's like, and if, if the solo is particularly themic, then stick yeah. to that, because yeah. it's, it's almost it becomes part of the... Yeah. you know the fabric of the song yeah. people expect to hear you know the guitar solo in Lessons in Love is, is what it is it's, it's, it is what it is yeah, yeah. so you yeah. have to play that you know yeah. um, so but, and the guys do that you know but it's it's really you know it's down to them you, you can play play how you want to play it you know and I mean my knowledge of arranging brass isn't great but I've, I'll sort of sit down and I've got a mojo horns uh, you know, software, yeah. which is, so I, I'll play what I think works, and then I'll just send it off to Sean or Dan Carpenter, who's yeah. a trumpet player, and Nicole uh, Thompson, who plays trombone with us, and these guys, they're just great, and they, they know what's expected of them, and they'll sort it all out, you know, and they do a lot of work that way. Mm. There was a, we did an interesting thing uh, back in February, actually, I got a call towards the end of last year from Bill Cobham, and, you know, he's one of my, my sort of hero from the early days of the Mahavishnu, you know, as a drummer, and when I, when I was playing drums, and uh, and also uh, he's become a friend now because he came and dept with us. We we did a show uh, at the Hay Jazz Festival in 2008, and Bill played drums. And when we did that, Bill didn't really do his homework uh, in learning <laughs> the tracks. And this is the, the, the relevance of what I'm saying is the fact that you know the guys who know what they're doing and. Uh, level 42 music isn't the sort of music you can really bluff because mm -hmm. it, there are all of these things that happen and it's, it is very, really choreographed that it has to go like that, you know. As Eric Clapton yeah. said when you gave him running in the family. Absolutely. And he said, go to mid and said, you do this, I can't handle it. Well, he said, there was another thing too, is that when, because I was thinking, look, you know, I said, guys, we don't have to do this. And Eric said, <laughs> Eric said, fuck off, I've been learning this for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> We're playing it. <laughs> <laughs> we followed up by asking Mark how hands-on he is with the running of the band from day to day. Yeah, it, it is incredible the amount of time it takes up, you know, that there must be a good two hours every day that I spend. My message always comments on it that, you know, that, that you, you get up, you, you get on the computer and there's emails to answer and there's, you know, there are agents to talk to and there... There are questions, there are interviews to do and stuff. And I mean, because you guys, you know, you do this thing, oh, we'll send you some questions. And you just send like 50 questions that want answered. Well, you know, what? You just cut and paste. Oh, yeah. Yeah, work. Oh, yeah, we have to yeah, yeah, just yeah. Sit And it takes ages. You know? yeah. It does, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not so keen. So I'll start cutting and pasting back now. <laughs> oh, no, I would. I recommend <laughs> it. I just take, take anybody else's answers and just paste it. No, as they say, not, yeah. what is it? The different notes, not, not in the right order. Yeah, that's yeah. right. All the notes. What's the criteria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, something like that. All right. So is there a manager? Is there a management company? Or is it is it MK? No, it's me. I, I look after the, the affairs. And, and I have to... Um, since we sort of folded back in, well, actually, since I since I got the band going again, look, just to sort of give you a timeline of, of how this sort of unfolded, is that we, we we folded the band. Mike and I sort of jumped overboard in 1994. Yeah, it, we'd, we'd sort of been we'd, we'd had nearly 15 years of, of working really hard on it and sort of going back to back, and we'd gone through some lineup changes <coughs> with the original Phil and Boone, the brothers, the Gould brothers. They left in '87. And then we got Gary Husband in and Al Murphy, which, you know, w was great. As, as sadly, Al Murphy passed yeah. away 18 months later, yeah. you know, so that kind of put the brakes on that whole thing. And then then we got, we sort of complimented the sax, because Chris Mack had been playing sax. And then we got Gary Barnacle in and, uh, John. and John Thurkel, yeah, on trumpet. And that was great. And we had Ali McCaig on vocals as well. And Lyndon Connor came in and did the run of shows that, that we had Alan Holdsworth do with us at Hammersmith Apollo, uh, as it was back there was Hammersmith Apollo, I think then. Um, uh, and so these sort of changes, it was great because, of course, now I'd met Lyndon. <clears throat> so when, when the band folded in 94, and I, I, sort of did, I just went and worked in the garden for a year, uh, just sort of 
relaxing really and enjoying mm. the fact that I, I didn't have to be doing this anymore, you know. And I, I also sort of partly company with my, my manager, Paul Crockford, who I'm still sort of best of mates with. Yeah. But there just didn't seem to be any point in, yeah. in having a manager as the band wasn't there anymore, you know. And plus, really, Paul and I had, had sort of been co-managing the band in, in many ways because of just the decision-making process and how we thought, you know, what we thought should happen, what we thought would be the next step for the band and this, that and the other. Did you so, feel that maybe burnt, burnt you out a little bit at the time? You know, I, I don't think it did. I think it, it might have been a saving grace for me because I had to focus. If you can imagine, sort of at the height of the, the 80s, um, you know, it was, a, it was a very hedonistic time. And, you know, that there was, you know, there was just tons of everything. There was just tons of alcohol, tons of drugs, tons of women. There were just tons of anything you wanted. It was, it was there for the taking, you know, and particularly when you're working in a touring in America because mm. America's just... Is, is you know it's the land of hedonism and, and you know whatever is happening they'll do it ten times more than yeah. anybody else. It sounds awful, Mark. <laughs> I know it. Does, it sounds it sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds very rock and roll, which it was. But and and it got to that got to a point where I was sort of abusing myself, you know, quite badly until we got to 1987 and we were on the Madonna tour and, and my, my manager, my friend Crockford, he said, you know, I've been sort of particularly obnoxious one night, you know, sort of off my tits. And he said, you're horrible when you're like that. And because he's my friend, mm. it really got to me, you know. And, and I thought, oh, yeah, you know, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to be like that to my friends and stuff? Because it stands to reason that, you know, when you're under the influence so much, that it changes your whole character and everything else. And so I stopped, and I stopped just overnight, and I, and I didn't sort of, I didn't do anything for seven years. I was just sort of really sober. And it was that sort of sobriety that made me focus on the band and get involved with Crop and, and you know sort of see what was happening and you know to, to, to see where we were going. It was just a funny time to be doing it with the band because there were these sea changes. You know the Gould brothers had left. Um, you know Gary Husband had come in and Al Murphy and then Al died and blah blah blah. Uh, you know so I think that for me a saving grace was taking on the responsibility yeah. of, of looking after the band. You know because it had to be done. And you have to take it seriously because, you know, if, if you're in a mess all the time, sure. everything else in a mess touch can happen. So if you're a fan of Mark or Level 42, you'll be well aware that the band always embraced new technology when it came to recording in the studio or live performance. How has Mark seen technology change now that he's in charge of running the band? Revenues no, that's right. And record industry, when, record did the first, when did the first iPod? Was that 2003? It was 2003, was it? Was it? Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what an incredible vision. Oh, you know? God. Yeah. Changed. And then they invaded a phone and took over the world. Right? Yeah. Planned, look, it? it is incredible, isn't it? You know, Because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sort of never not by your side. I mean, look, you're running everything from your <laughs> oh, no, smartphone. It's nuts. Yeah. And it's just become such a part of your life. You know, I had my first Mac... SE, because working with Wally Badger, who also in Level 42, who sort of co-produced the records with us, sort of latterly, um, Wally was a real Mac man, and because he was sort of largely synths, playing synthesizers, so he was really interested in the technology that was involved, and it, it sort of, we couldn't really get on board with the, you know, he came along in 1985 and he said, right, everybody, we all need to get these Macintoshes, these Mac SEs, so we all got one. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what we were supposed to do with it, you know, because it just sort of sat there on your desk, so you'd open it up, and and it, you know it, it was not all the small as this kit either. It, no, well, actually, it was it was the, small. The monitors com, com, yeah. yeah, it was all sort of it was the all-in-one thing. Okay. Already, like uh, they were sort of way ahead of their time, just in terms of the design of the whole thing, it being all-in-one. But you know the floppy drives that you used to sort of load yeah, that's programs right. up with. It's like disc after disc yeah, after disc. Yeah, yeah. And it asks you for the next disc. Do you yeah, remember all that sort of yeah, stuff? Yeah. And then one day Wally said, there's a company in uh, California called Jasmine and they're making this thing. It's called a hard drive. And uh, it was 680 quid or something, and which back then was a quite a lot of money. Yeah. And so I, was, I was sent, sent off for it. And it was eighty megabytes, right? This hundred, <laughs> and it sounded it sounded like it sounded like a Harrier jump jet because it, it, it was all sort of span up the speed and stuff. And it was all scuzzy, you know. So you had these yeah. massive connectors yeah. that didn't, you could plug it into the back, and and I can remember like trying to explain to anybody that was interested that would come to the studio. 
even though I still wasn't using the computer for anything. But I'd say, this drive, I said, is the equivalent of 80 discs. <laughs> Can you even imagine? And, and everyone's going, oh, yeah. What's what you so what? with it? And, and it's, because I, I did a DJ gig last week. Oh, it's my new thing. I, I, I got invited by Tim Burgess. He said, Mark, do you want to come and do a DJ set at Tim Peake's Diner? Yeah. At the Isle of Wight Festival. And, and I, you know, typical idiot, I just said, yeah. You know, I've never done it before. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and then I started thinking, well, what do you have to do? You know, so, <coughs> but I, I would sort of jump in. So I got my Pioneer decks all sorted out. And I got a, a, I got a 64 gig um, memory stick, you know. This, this big. That's it. It's the smallest thing you've ever seen. You, you, you just lose it. It's so small, it's stupid, you know. And, and, and you just think, that much, there's 64 gig on this. And, you know, now you can get a uh, terabyte, yeah, yep. one terabyte yeah. flash drive. Insane amounts of storage. You know, and it's incredible. And, it, and once again, it's like 600 quid. Well, I paid for 80 megabytes back in <laughs> 1987 or something. Just, yeah, super. For those who are unaware, the band actually stopped in 1994 and Mark went on something of a hiatus for four years between 1994 and 98. So how had the whole industry changed when he came back in 1998? The way that the band came back was, um, it, it was, it was sort of quite organic in a way really, because you know, it had gone, but the band, you know, had been really successful. I mean, we were yeah. selling like, you know, millions of records, and we were basically you can't, you know. And this is one of the things that I, I kind of tried doing when I reached 40, which would have been about eight, you know, 1997, or something. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, what, what drives you, what sort of, what makes you, it makes anybody the person they are, is, is just a drive, is a want yeah. to do something. You know, you cannot not do something. And and if you're lucky enough to be able to make a, a living doing something you love doing, well, it's not really work anyway. You know, and, and so, you know, playing, for me, playing music is just great. And I, how can I not play music? And the very fact that people want to hear the music that I make, well, that's just a blessing, you know. Mm. I love music. I, you know, a lot of my time is spent, like I said last night, I was at the Fleetwood Mac show, that Sunday me and the missus went to see Kylie Minogue and, Grace Jones and Nile Rogers in Hyde Park. I can't go to Glastonbury next week. I'm gutted about that because I went there last last year with the missus again, and I saw you know Conor Moccasin, who I, I love Conor Moccasin, and St Vincent, and you know Dolly Parton, and I just love seeing new young bands and seeing you know my, my youngest daughter Marley. She's she's up here in London now. We're, we're sort of in her flat, as it were. So she's. And she goes and does open mic nights and bits and pieces, and I yeah. think that's so exciting. I love the fact that there's such a good sort of music yeah. scene. And Six Music is, is such a great music station. Be saying this last yeah, year. you know, and I found that, you know, when I sort of <coughs> discovered Six Music, really just from the fact I've doing so many hotels, that, and TV is so boring, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I just would put Six Music on, and some Mark Riley would be playing some mm -hmm. stuff in the evenings, and, you know, I love Sean Keaveney's show, he's a mate of mine as well, and, and Lauren Laverne, and you know, Sundays you, you listen to, you know, Karis Matthews, and yeah. Giles Peterson, Saturday afternoon, he plays such great music, you know, and, and where, what other radio station can you, one minute he'll play with a chick career, and the next yeah. minute Aerito, and then, yeah. you know, Stan Getz or something, it's just all this really eclectic stuff, yeah. and that, that's great, that's good for the mind and, and the soul, and you see, if you, if you are a musician, you never ever stop wanting to do that sort of thing, you know. So, I forgot what your question was. Well, it's basically, uh, how had the band changed when you came back? How had life changed being yeah. at level 42? True. Well, it sort of, all of this, the, the sort of the sea change came for me, is, you know, I had to sort of sort a couple of things out in my private life. Not, it wasn't like my divorce or anything like that, because that happened years, that was around 1990. Yeah. But I was, I was sort of rolling around in this bloody great house on the Isle of Wight, you know, with my current wife, Rhea. Yeah. And we were looking after the garden. I, for some reason, I just thought it was a good idea to turn the entire seven acres into gardens. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh boy, it, you know, and, and I didn't have any gardens. My parents, you know, came and, and when I was sort of away working, they came and looked after the garden. They did a great job. And then my dad got ill, and so he retired. So it was just down to me. 
and the missus looking after the garden. One day, I, I was been, I'd been sweeping up in the garage all the leaves because it was sort of an open fronted pole barn, and uh, cause there's a big heap of leaves. Uh, and then this massive gust of wind came and just put everything back exactly where it had just been. It's a metaphor for so life. It was exactly that. <laughs> and I just sort of stood there. And just in that moment, Mrs. Oh, came around the corner with two cups of tea. She, she obviously looked at me and she said, are you all right? And I just said, look, I said, how would you feel if we sold this place? Let's move. And she said, oh, I'd love it. You know? And that was kind of the first thing. Because then you, then you have to declutter, because it's like you're in this bloody great place. I've got the studio. I've got a shed. That, that's got that's full of flight cases, empty flight cases. This is one of the things that when when I folded the band, um, and I, I sort of went to see the accountants because we had to sort of just shut things down, you know. And I had companies running that needed closing down. Yeah. And one of the things that, that sort of came to light was they said, "What, what are you going to do with the cage?" I said, "What what cage?" And they said, well, "You've got a cage of John Henry's." I said, "Oh, what's in there?" And they said, well, <laughs> Just what isn't in fl- it? flight cases? You know, it's just empty yeah. flight cases. Because you know, every time you go out, you get another sure. gear, and then and you just got all these empty flight cases. Yeah. Flight cases cost a fortune out made anyway. Mm-hmm. But when they're empty, what do you do? They, you put them in a cage. So I said, well, how, how, much is the, they, how much is the cage? And they said, well, it's seven and a half grand a year to rent the cage. I said, well, how long will we have that then? They said, oh, 10 years. So I think, you know, I think right, so 75 grand <laughs> yeah. on, on, a, on a, a piece room of room in London right, yeah. that, with just empty cases in it. Yeah. And you go, Clunk. <laughs> Why didn't nobody tell me about this? Well, yeah. So you're I'm, not the first person that's happened I, to. I know. I know this. <laughs> it, this is all part and parcel. Of it. This is classic stuff. Yeah. You know? So I just, I just had a big shed made in the garden and put all the cases in there, yeah. and then it didn't cost anything. You know, it was, it was all being done and stuff. But so consequently, now I want to get rid of the house. All of this stuff's got, got rid of. And you know, I, I had God knows how many guitars and basses and drum kits. And I and bought one. Stein down there. Did I you? had your stingray. Did you? Nice, lovely bass. Four album. string. Yeah, yeah. Was it maroon? It was it? Uh, translucent red mm. that you used on Guaranteed Forever Now and Trash. <coughs> I did, yeah. What yeah. did you do with all your basses? I got in touch with my mate at the bass centre <coughs> and just said, look, you know, do you want to take them off my hands or sell them for me or, or do whatever, you know? And so he just said, oh, yeah. This is Barry, is it? Yeah, it was, yeah. And, and, you know, and I mean, there were just loads and loads of bases. And there was part of me that was just thinking, well, <clears throat> you know, I've been given them anyway. So, uh, you know, I just got rid of all this stuff. I kept, I kept the sort of, the, the ones that really meant something to me. Yeah. You know, so I, I kept my first JD, the, the, the Supernatural, the 003A. Mm. That's the serial number of it. And it's the one that is sort of synonymous with the, all that early level 42 stuff. Yeah. Although a lot of the time I, I didn't actually play that one because John was making lots for me. And, th- you know, th- they I mean, it's, it's a fantastic bass and it sounds great. And, and John, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, um, sort of refurbed it for me. And I, I made him swear not to change any electronics because mm-hmm. he was, you know, I know what he'd do. He'd sort of swap everything out and just yeah. put it all in. I said, I really don't want you to do that. You know, <coughs> just clean the pots, but keep the pots as they are. Because these things, even with like the king bases, that you, you know, uh, in essence, they should be identical. They all sound different. Yeah. You know, and Rob Green, he'll be the first one to say, I don't know what it is, Mark. Is, but because he makes all the circuits by hand, yeah. some components are slightly it's different. Exactly, yeah. it's, you know, and, and something changes. And we had it with the first, the very first two parametric bases. The red one was really zingy and lovely and the black one wasn't quite so great and I, and you know I, I had a long sit down with Rob and we were, I said can you hear it mm. he's going yeah he said there's not a fizz is there and, and he was because <coughs> Rob's you know R- Rob's the scientist with all of this so he can pull out a box and he puts clips on it's they have this great way of taking the back plate off and then he sort of crocodile clips up and you'll see you can sit and play and he watches what happens mm-hmm. and he'll That's see cool. what's happening and then he'll say Okay, <clears throat> let's. What would happen if I put this in? And so he's got a he's got a software that he can say what yeah. would happen if you put this yeah. different capacitor in or this yeah. you know whatever it is this gizmo. Uh, yeah this little gizmo, and he's going oh yeah that's interesting he said so in fact he said we need to lift him much more up on the high end he said and that gives you that sweet thing you wouldn't think that it would be effect you know that, that it would on, on bass it would work this way but that's the sound I'm sort of looking for so wanting. It is incredible, you know, and you wouldn't think that that, and it's right up yeah. around the sort of the, I don't know, 
20k or something that's like, hearing yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's the thing uh, you know and, and you, as soon as you take that away you, you lose it you know it starts going back and to you notice it even more on stage <laughs> because you're dealing with all the yeah, acoustics yeah, yeah. yeah you do. despite stating on several occasions that he's not overly precious about being a bass player we wondered whether Mark had continued playing bass during the intervening years between the band's pause in 1994 and Mark's return as a solo artist in 1998 do you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a bass player. In the respect that I, I, I go and sit and play bass for yeah. a couple of hours or something, you know. I mean, I'm kind of dreading, you know, this weekend coming up because I know my fingers are going to hurt like hell, yeah. you know, because <laughs> I just haven't played bass for. Well, the last thing I did actually was the weekend before last, so that was at the Rock and Horsepower gig. But I just played two songs, you know, and. Um, uh, you know that's not enough to keep your fingers in at all. But you see, for me, that's not that's it, that's really uh, of no consequence because the the, the creativity that comes with bass the, it is almost for me. It's like it's, you get it out of the case, having not played it for a while, and it's like an old friend, and you put yeah. it on, and something good yeah. happens. You know, and it's even nice if you can do that with others. You know, and, and I've always had this this really good sort of symbiotic thing with Mike Lindup that. That, and, and I've got it now with Pete Ray Biggin too is that you know we haven't seen each other for ages we get together we plug in and then just really nice things mm. start to happen I love that and the guys always say you know wow we should, somebody should be recording this. someone should record yeah. this stuff yeah. you know yeah. but for me I, I just think that's no, alright you know, some of the nicest it? clips on YouTube going back to the day were things with just you <coughs> and Mike like there's a Rapido clip from like 87 it's just him with a DX7 you with a bass just playing. Oh just yeah, like, just it, yeah. No, no vocals or anything. Just playing around with each other. Yeah, just and it's not because like that. Mike. That's really how Mike and I started like that. But we we shared a flat in. Um, uh, in you done in Streatham. Right? Yeah, we were. We were just just. Uh, it was sort of um, not Clapham. It's what was what's it called? Is it like sort of tooting? Ballum tooting. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, you know, we, we just had this bedsit, this ground floor bedsit, and you know, and that's like when we wrote June Chew and things like that, you know, and, and all those tracks were just me and Mike sitting in the flat, and yeah, just playing, like really, really quietly, of course, because yeah. there was always, shut up! <laughs> we wanted to tap into Mark's knowledge and expertise and asked him what advice and pointers would he offer an up and coming artist or band trying to make it in the industry now? What do you need? What, you know, what, what do you need to, to, to be successful in this, in this business? Right? You need a drive, but a lot of musicians have that drive anyway because yeah. they want to be musicians. Yeah. And, you know, and there takes, to become a good player anyway, you, you do need, uh, you know, you need to apply yourself at some point to learn your craft and to be good yeah. at what you do, you know. I mean, you, you know, rarely you get these guys that are just like out the box, brilliant, you know. And, um, you know, seeing Fleetwood Mac last night, for example, um, you know, Lindsay Buckingham was really great on guitar, yeah. and uh, you know, I didn't realise he was as good a player as he is, but <clears throat> really impressive. And that's obviously this guy's just got this amazing talent, you know. But what what do you need to do to sort of drive that on? You need to do things, you know. That there's that there's more than one way to make an omelette, you know. But the way that I've found, you know, is to actually be aware of everything. Don't assume that somebody else is, is making decisions on your behalf mm. or that somebody else is in control. Mm. I think there's a misconception that you'll, you'll see a young band or you'll hear young guys talking and they'll always say things like, we need to get a manager. Uh, you know, well, you don't really need to get a manager. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> Speak to people who know what business is about. You know, you're the only guy that's ever really going to look after yourself and your own affairs, um, and that's fine. And if you want to do that for the rest of the guys in your band, then that's fine too, because you, you'll... You know, I think I see it with, I get the feeling that everything, everything are, are pretty much like this too, you know, and you see bands like the Dutch Uncles coming through. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't really know these guys personally, yeah. so I, I could be wrong, but I get the feeling that there's a there's a, a good sense these days of, look, if we want this to happen, then we're going to make, the, we all have to make this happen, you know, and it's things like from artwork to the music that's being made to ways of recording, you know. I think that's what I loved about Conor Moccasin's last work and I saw this sort of little documentary he made and he's, he's really recording this whole thing in a hotel room just on a, on a multi-track cassette mm. recorder and it sounds great you know and, and the ideas are absolutely fantastic 
And you can see with, with Conan that he has got the, he's got the whole package is going for him. He's got the look down. He understands how he wants to set. St. Vincent's the same. Mm. You know that she she's a fantastic guitarist. Mm. She's writing this great music. She's got the whole image thing nailed. You know, for, for us when we started out as level 42, we really had no concept of any of that at all. You know, and we really were just sort of four lads who, who sort of hung around together. And and it was important that we had the manager then. It was John Gould because he was it, it, he knew things that we didn't know. Yeah, okay. You know, and that it, for us it was important then. But you learn, you know, and I think that that's probably as important a thing as anything, Joel, is that you, you just you want to learn as you go along, and, and every mistake you make, it's not the end of the world, and if you can learn from it, and it's probably been a good thing, you know, and you're always going you're always going to make mistakes. There's no way of suddenly jumping in and, and it being mm. massively successful, you know. I mean, it took me ages when, if, if we sort of jump back a bit into how this sort of band got going again, yeah. it, it really sort of started from when I, I had this sort of this cathartic clear out and, uh, you know, me and the wife, we moved to another place on the Isle of Wight. We sort of downsized considerably <coughs> and... The irony being, since we've lived, we've lived there now 17 years, and, and I've extended the house so much and bought all the land around it that I've ended up with the <laughs> same size with, as you with, had with before. Bigger, bigger You're still place brushing up the leaves. Going, yeah, I'm still, well, you know, have I done this? You know, and I've got loads of tractors and dealers and stuff like that. You know, and, but that's and I've sort of fallen back into that. But that's all right because I actually there is a part of me that really digs that. You know, but when we did that thing, it, it uh, when we sort of when we stepped back. It gave me the, the, the sort of the, the time then to actually focus on the music again, but instead of like going out and clearing up the leaves. And so, uh, you know, I just got to put in songs together and I went to Warner Chapels, who were my publishers at the time, and said, Look, I've got a collection of songs that, you know, I, one in particular I, really, I would like Katie Lang to have it, and there's another one I've written that I thought Brian Ferry would be good, because Roxy Music were sort of one of my first favourite bands, 1972, you know, I just love that thing. And um, they said, oh, no, that sounds great. You know, you should do it yourself. And we'll introduce you to, uh, you know, Terry Shand at Eagle Records. And, and then I made the one-man album, which was just doing those, those tracks. And when I did that, which was now 1997, 98, uh, you know, I, I asked Neil if he could get me some gigs, you know. just And there was a really sort of small gigs just around. And, and I got my brother Nathan in which was a really good move, because this was the first time. Because Nath was just about to chuck the towel in. And, uh, you know, he said, um, I remember, it was actually my dad t telling me, and he said that Nath said, uh, you know, I, I, it's not going to happen for me, Dad. And, you know, so I've had enough. <clears throat> and I thought it was really sad, because he's, he's such a talent. So, I was going to ask, actually, do you find yeah. he's a great foil for you? Because no. he is... A such a good musician anyway yeah, on yeah, so is, many yeah. things yeah. A great bass player as well great yeah. guitar player but do you find having him in the band is almost like you haven't even got to worry about that well it, it's it's completely reliable I mean yeah. that's that's the sort of the, the beauty of it and, and that there's this sort of gap that you know this age gap between <coughs> Nathan and I because he's 12 years younger than me yeah. he played with um, you at the jazz cafe with the yes. uh, one is called yeah he did yeah that's right yeah he did yeah. and um, you know and he's been I mean, Nathan's worked with me now for, you know, well over 15 years and yeah. stuff, yeah, 98. And his band and supported you on the final tour. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that was it, really. And I think then, because Nathan just felt he was sort of bumping him on the bump and just didn't want to do it um, anymore. Uh, and I thought, well, that's sad, you know. And whereas I was just about to sort of, like, start this new chapter for myself, and I thought, well, maybe Nathan would be a part of it, you know, would like to be part of it. And, and you know, and so he became... And he really is sort of like uh, just a right-hand man now. He's yeah, not having a great wingman. And, you know, I, I can trust him musically. It's exactly the same way I trust Mike. And I don't have to explain stuff. Yeah. They just know the way it goes, you know. Yeah. And I've been really lucky with, with the drummers too because when I, when I wanted to sort of get this going again, first of all, I used a, a mate of Nathan's, uh, Trevor Smith, who is a really lovely guy and another Isle of Wight lad, as it happens. And... Um, Trev sort of did, we did one tour together, and uh, where we sort of went out around Europe, and it was really nice, but I think Trev found it a bit stressful, and, uh, and so he bailed out, he said he, d he didn't want to do it, because he, he, I said, look, you know, do, do you want to come out with me next time? So I gave Gary Husband a call, and then Gary came in, and, and uh, then we sort of 
now it was all starting to get back to the level 42 thing again. And what was happening, Joel, is that, you know, okay, I played most of the one-man songs and some stuff from this, this album, Trash, which I'll come back to in a second, because this kind of leads on to the business side of things. Um, but I was putting more and more level 42 songs in, because the, the punters that were coming along were saying, play, you know, lessons in that, play something about it. So your audience had stayed with you? <clears throat> They've been incredible. Yeah, yeah. You know, really, really great. And I think that when it sort of got pared down to its bare bones like that, the the, the real hardcore guys who were in from album one, yeah. who, who were sort of ranting and raving, by the time we got to 1985 and 86 and were selling millions of records, they hated it. Because mm-hmm. they were going, no, the, the best yeah, stuff you yeah. ever did was yeah. back then, you know, and Return of the Rugged Handsome Man, and your B-sides were always the best songs you ever wrote, and all this sort of stuff, you know, which is... I'm still waiting for you to do fine. that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, so, uh, so really the sort of the level thing was happening, and, I, and I, I, so, so I got in touch with Mike, and I hadn't seen Mike for years, you know, for ages. We were all still friends and stuff. There wasn't any animosity at all, but we were just often doing our own things, you know. And you know, and I said to Mike, you know, can I? Because we had this. The, the arrangement was that the, the last last man, and this really came about because when Phil and Boom left, we always had this thing of like, you know, who gets the name? We said, well, the last man in the boat. I mean, if you want to leave, then you leave. Fine, but the band can carry on. But there wasn't really a last man in the boat. Mark and I sort of we were still just outside the boat, you know. And, he wants to get in. But by now I was touring with our Gary husband. I had Lyndon Connor who played with us on the last, uh, well, the last tour, but he, he played with us at the Hammersmith Odeon shows. And <coughs> um, my brother Nathan and uh, I think Sean Freeman was in now playing sax. Yeah. And we were playing largely level 42 music and stuff. And then I asked Mike if he wanted to come in and, and sort of jam with us at a show we did at the Forum in London. And it was great. He loved it and I loved it. And, you know, we all loved it and it was it was a very sort of sweet thing and you know and then Neil came to me and he said look you know there's a we've got a bigger tour and now we were starting to get the bigger and bigger shows and he was saying you know do you want to do the, Albert, the Royal Albert Hall on this one and I thought oh, I'd love to do that I sort of got Mike involved and... being the shy retiring quiet bass god that he is we asked Mark when did he actually think his bass playing peaked well, do you know, I think I think I probably peaked bass wise in about 1983. In terms of literally, just, like, just in terms of, of of you know, sort of finding things that you know, I was I was sort of I uh, sort of used to excite the sound back then. You know, yeah. Yeah. now it's you know, I love playing. I mean, I just love playing. I love music. I love making music. And you know, what I do is is just kind of what I've always done. And yeah, I'm probably, I was, you know, as, as competent as doing it as I, I was, but I'm just not any better, and I'm not more inventive than I was, you know? And I think it was because it was all new and out of the box, and yeah. nobody else was doing it the way I was doing it. Yeah. And that's, that's, that was, you know, as I said about, everybody can play it, of course they can, because it's like, I say play this, and you say, okay, can you play that? But it's, it's coming up with it in the first place, when yeah. you do things. Yeah. You know, and that what was taken from, you know, I was trying to be Jack Bruce and Stanley Clark and Jack Pastorius all rolled into one, you know, with a big s- slice of Larry Grant, as it turned out. Um, you know, all of these things, you, you put them all in a mix and pop, and then mm-hmm. hopefully something comes out that's a bit like yourself, you know. Of course, quite a, um, a way that the bass showed, because a lot of people have never seen you play with Nick. Obviously, you did it on the tour as well. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. that threw a lot of people a curve, and you were running a distorted channel through guitar. Yeah. And people were like, yeah, yeah. it's all right. And I hadn't thought about that, and no, suddenly more people are doing it. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's just a, an interesting thing. I mean, that, that wasn't. Was that a premeditated thing, or was it something that have been playing no, around? No, it's just something that I, I saw. Yeah. Um, it's so you know, it's the, the, it's different. It's really different. It's really different. Uh, also some Vincent play, oh, it's it's the right and oh, I'm yeah. also seeing like Royal Blood and Drench, and, and I, it was more Drench, the fact that Drench, it was a question that was posed to me by Sean Keevans in Matt Ever at the Six Music, they said, Mark, why is it that, that there's no bass players in, in the modern indie bands, that the bass has become irrelevant? 
And I sort of think, think about it, and I said, well, actually, you're wrong. I said, if you think right. about it, all they're playing is bass lines. Right. It's really the guitar that's become relevant. But what's yes. missing now are guitar solos. Yeah. Yes. And, and what, what they're doing is so you're getting guy bands like Drenge and Royal Blood and etc. etc. Et um, that are really, they're using these polyphonic, um, you know, pole to the electro harmonic pedals. Yeah. And they're putting either two octaves above and an octave and two octaves yeah. or, or below. And they're running them through, like, Overdriven guitar channels, or running it through a bass, amp, and they're actually playing the bass themselves. But all they're playing, all they're doing is they're doing um, like Led Zeppelin riffs. Yeah. So his whole thing is, which is really just a bass riff, you know. Yeah. So the whole thing is really that what's become an irrelevant is, you know, is you know, not just playing guitar, but, yeah. you know, which of course is not and that's yeah. just how it changed. So wrapping up the interview while a photo shoot is going on. I fired some rapid questions at Mark on a variety of topics that I've always wanted to know the answers to. Going back to sort of the 80 to 94 period, is there a level 42 vault of sort of live footage and stuff? Like bands like Queen used to film everything and sling it in the vault. Is there a lot of stuff out there? I know that there's, um, the stuff just keeps sort of resurfacing through. Yeah. Um, but did the know, band have stuff, stuff officially filmed other than no. Fate the Company? And no, Life not really, because it, it was it was an incredibly expensive thing to do. Yeah. And that the, oh, it, okay. you know, really the record company started investing money in this from about 1985. Yeah. Machine time. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. it. When, when we started sort of shifting, shifting units. Yeah, <laughs> shifting units. Then they started spending okay. some money. When I interviewed you by phone last year, we had a chat about that supergroup thing that always kept sort of popping up as a rumour in the press. Um, did you kind of start a recording thing with Brian May? Did you sort of chuck a few ideas about... We, we did, we did. We, we, he came down, we, we, I, sort of, I rented this house in Kingston. It was just very suburban. It was like this Terry and June's sort of place. <laughs> And uh, it was it was really funny because the, we had this place and on this one day Paul Young, Midgeur, Brian May, and um, I think Carl Palmer showed yeah. up and we, it, everyone just sort of I can just imagine the neighbours sort of twitching the curtains thinking, <laughs> it's that man from Queen, you know, it's that man who saved the world. You know? So what, what sort of time frame would this be? Late 80s, early 90s? No, this 90s? was about 94, 95. Okay, so after yeah, the after, after finished. Band. Okay. And it was, it was kind of an idea that, that was really, we just sort of got together just to see if there was any, any sort of mileage in it. And I don't, I don't think there was really. Cause what I think was the music like? We never really got any, we never Did really jammed. Like, no, oh. no, we just sort of, I, I sort of played them some ideas that I had yeah. and, and I couldn't see them for dust. <laughs> <laughs> they were gone, <laughs> but no, that's all right. Yeah, that, that's that's fine, you know. And I, I think I'm very much. I like joining in. I can I can sit in on anybody else's stuff. When they asked you about tuition videos and DVDs hadn't been invented there, you said you didn't do such things as you didn't feel you had any answers to anything. <laughs> and there's no point me teaching someone to do it because I'm already doing it. Otherwise, they'll end up with all my bad habits. <laughs> Oh, now, so is that something it. you might consider now? Because the, one, the technology's come along, and two, regardless of how modest you are, people still want to learn how you do what you do. And if you oh, go I'm on YouTube happy. any day of the week, there are a million people who think they can do it and they can't. So surely it would be far better for people to you learn put it from. It on your own label. Easy. So I'm asking you that question: Would you still consider doing it, or? I'll consider it. You know, whether I'll do it. Or not. Because it's basically, we were saying in the car park at the station, Mark could do this in an afternoon, there's put it out. For it. Do you not, think there is? Yeah, massively. Idea, but there's people with massively. Yeah. I think things have come full circle where maybe for a period doing what you do wasn't hip and people yeah. would kind of sneer at it. I think it's beyond, well, it's gone past that, that now. Gone, yeah. yeah. But it, well, I also think too is that the, you know, you, you sort of said, has anything changed? You know, how do I play differently now yeah. than I did? And, and you know, yeah. I said, well, I think I probably done it all by 1983, yeah. and that was when I was kind of inventing stuff. Yeah. But then you made it, you said, you know, it surprised me when I got the plectrum out and stuff. Yeah. And, and there, you know, there's, there was a there's a track on Sirens when it, it, it there's just this plectrum of the thing, and, and it's what it comes down to, and and same as like using the pole pedal and, and overdriving. It's you 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 know, it's your duty. 
this is what you play with really, it's your ears. Mm. And it's how, it, it's the sound that you make, that's the important thing. It's like the same as, um, you know, my mate Rob the Bank, who's the curator of Best Simon and I was with him and his missus and my missus at the Fleetwood Match show last night. And there's kind of the assumption that, you know, that I'd sit there and then I'd sneer and get sniffy about um, John McVie's bass playing. No way. He, everything that he does is absolutely perfect. Within the context within of what the context they do. Of that music, and that's exactly what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it will be totally incongruous if he was suddenly to try and take a, you know, what would be the point in that? It would sound wrong, it wouldn't work. And, and, and that, then, you, you, just, you laugh at that and yeah. you say, that's, you know. They are such the, if you like, the, the bedrock of what that band is. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, it, it is. That's the rhythm section. You and know, they are such simple parts, and that even the producers go, you can't change that. It, it yeah, is what it, it is. It just works, you know. Yeah. And it sort of plods along, and, it, and, it's, and it's ideal, you know. And then you've got all these great melodies and lyrics that go on on top of it. It's the perfect... So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Mark King from 2015. If you did, please hit the subscribe button below. Hit the notification bell so that you receive notifications when I post up new videos. And please give the video a thumbs up, I'd really appreciate it. If you've got any questions or comments about the video, leave them below and I'll come back to you as soon as I can. And please check out other Mark King and Level 42 related videos on the channel. Look forward to seeing you here again on Brooks's Bass Corner.